So if things weren't bad enough for Napoleon after the Russian campaign, when he gets back to France, a fourth coalition has now formed against him, and this is going to mark his final downfall. All right, so we're going to see, uh, just like the previous coalitions, there's very little difference, right? The major countries are always there. All right, so this coalition is going to be Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia, and they're going to crush Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig. Okay, <clears throat> so... How do they crush them? Napoleon, first off, is outnumbered two to one, which is kind of crazy to think about. Why? Remember how during the Russian campaign uh, I was saying that the Grand Army that Napoleon brings to Russia has 600,000 men? Pretty impressive, right? But then he retreats and it's only 30,000, which is kind of really sad because all those people die just because Napoleon is kind of overexerting himself in Russia? Yes. But when he gets back to France, he actually gets an army, Grand Army back, all right? He has another 600,000 men. I don't know how he gets them, but he does. Now, in the Battle of Leipzig, he loses 500,000 of them again. Okay, so um, we're, this is the largest battle in world history until the 20th century, which is why so many people on Napoleon's side die. Okay, so, um, so Napoleon's defeated, and then the Prince of Austria, a guy named Clemens Mon von Metternich, uh, issues a proposal to Napoleon called the Frankfurt Proposal, all right? And here's what he says. He says, Napoleon, if you want to keep your throne, you need to reduce France to its historical size. So in other words, you need to give back all this territory that you conquered during all your wars. What do you think Napoleon says to that? He says no, right? So basically what we see now is we need to have some sort of organization formed to try to get rid of Napoleon and try to figure out how to enforce peace terms in France. And that organization is called the Quadruple Alliance, because there are four countries involved in it, of course. Okay, so again, we're dealing with Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia. Um, when they uh, first organize, they also protect themselves with uh, 150 soldiers each, all right, to enforce peace. And when they go towards Paris with all these soldiers, Napoleon sees them coming and he abdicates. All right, so on April 4th of 1814, Napoleon is no longer emperor. And in his place, they put a Bourbon king. So it's actually Louis XVI's brother, Louis XVIII. All right, and it's interesting what Louis XVIII does. Um, he issues this thing called the Charter of 1814. And uh, what it does is it creates a two-house two legislature, or as you can see there, a bicameral legislature, as well as a constitution, okay? And uh, there are a couple of ways you can think about this. You could say, well, in a way, this is, this is kind of preserving some of the traditions of the revolution, because never before have we had a king uh, issue a constitution in his country, right? So that's, that's new. Um, but at the same time, we could say it's sort of going back to the old order because it's only representing the upper classes. All right, so in a way, we're getting a little bit of revolutionary principles, but in another way, we're going back. Also, realize that, um, that Louis XVIII preserves a lot of Napoleon's reform, so that also is kind of preserving some of the elements of the revolution. Keeps the Napoleonic code, keeps the concordat with the Pope, so Catholics in France are happy, and also peasants are happy because the abolition of feudalism is going to stick. Okay, so how are peace terms in France actually drawn up? Um, Louis XVIII agrees to give up all the territory gained since the beginning of the revolution. Okay, so just what Napoleon was refusing to do, Louis saying, okay. All right, now this is kind of nice for France. At first, um, the Quadruple Alliance says, uh, d does not issue any indemnity or reparations on France. So you know how war reparations are what losers have to pay? Um, so like when Germany had to pay massive war reparations, um, those are not imposed on France, partly because Louis XVIII says he won't pay them. But nonetheless, France doesn't owe a ton of money um, after these wars. All right, Napoleon is exiled to the island of Elba, although interestingly, he is paid um, by France. Um, and then the Quadruple Alliance basically decides, all right, we've drawn up peace settlements for France. Now we have to figure out what to do with the rest of Europe. Okay, so let's take a look at what, again, this is what the map of Europe looked like prior to um, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, right? So see how big France is, it's pushing into the Netherlands, Belgium, some of the Italian provinces, the Illyrian provinces. Okay, we're going to get back to this, but this is the new, these are going to be the new borders of Europe. So see how France has shrunken. Um, see Austria and, Austria and Prussia also have solidified much more. But before we get to that, let's talk about the 
uh, Congress of Vienna, okay, which uh, is going to meet uh, from September of 1814 to June of 1815. And again, this is going to try to draw a peace for all of Europe, okay? So again, it's going to be the quadruple alliance, so it's going to have these major representatives uh, in Europe, okay? The first one's going to be the Austrian prince, we mentioned him before, Clemens von Metternich, all right? And he is really, he's actually known historically as the father of conservatism. He wants to get rid of any kind of um, um, liberal idea or reform uh, that had been imposed during the revolution because he saw it as a huge threat to the Habsburg Empire. Right, because of course the Austrians are Habsburgs, right? And we saw how the um, the French Revolution was a huge threat to Austria, so he is very anti-France. We also see England uh, represented by Lord Castlereagh, and what England's going for is a balance of power. So they basically don't want France to ever be like more powerful than any other country in Europe. So they want to try to kind of surround Europe with uh, stronger states. All right, Prussia wants to get back some territory that it lost. To Napoleon, um, and uh, Russia actually wants to rule Poland. All right, so these are the different things that they want. There are other countries that go to the Congress of Vienna, but most of them don't do much. So they're actually referred to as the Dancing Congress because they basically just go to parties, and instead of really doing much, they're just there to kind of generate favorable public opinion about what the Congress is doing. So um, okay, the three things that they're going for here, um, they are going for legitimacy, compensation, and balance of power. So these are all things that the members of the Congress of Vienna are attempting to achieve for post-French Revolutionary Europe. Legitimacy. Okay, remember how Napoleon was uh, putting a bunch of his family members on thrones uh, throughout Europe to try to, you know, uh, make his empire that much stronger? Um, what happens with, le uh, with legitimacy is that uh, the Congress of Vienna is pushing to get those old families, those old ruling families that had been deposed uh, for more than two decades because of revolutionary warfare, they're trying to get those old families back on the throne. So, um, so what happens um, in France, Spain, and Naples, the Bourbons come back. We already saw that in France with Louis XVIII. Okay, Holland, Sardinia, and Tuscany, and Medina, they get their ruling dynasties back. And of course, the Papal States are going to go back to the Pope. All right, so what does compensation mean? Um, so we think of compensation as payment, obviously. <clears throat> so basically what, um, what these different countries in continental Europe want, they say we made sacrifices to defeat Napoleon. So they want some sort of reward for that. So they all kind of take a different shape. All right, England actually gets a series of naval bases. It gets one on the island of Malta, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean. It gets Ceylon, which is now uh, Sri Lanka, which is off the coast of India. It gets the Cape of Good Hope in Africa. And uh, now let's turn to the map to see what some of these other places get. All right, um, Austria is going to get uh, the Italian province of Lombardy. So see how Austria is getting part of Italy. Um, it's also going to get uh, Venetia and uh, Galicia from Poland. All right, so it's actually getting, it's expanding its borders both east and west. And it's getting the Illyrian provinces um, along the Adriatic Sea. So Austria expands really significantly. Um, and that's not really a surprise because Metternich is so important to the Congress of Vienna. <clears throat> uh, Russia gets what it wants. It gets uh, to rule over Poland, right, and it also gets part of Western Ukraine. So Alexander I is effectively going to be the king of Poland now. Okay, Prussia, it gets the Rhineland right here, okay, and it also gets uh, three-fifths of Saxony and part of Poland, all right, so see how Prussia's gotten a lot bigger. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit more about the German Confederation in, in a little bit, and see how because of its resistance to Napoleon, Prussia is going to turn into that more unified state, which eventually, of course, is going to become Germany. All right, balance of power, the third principle of settlement that these members of the Congress of Vienna are going for, um, is also relevant to the map, so we're keeping this one up here. Um, they're trying to arrange the map of Europe <clears throat> so that never again can one state really upset the international border and, and kind of change around the balance of power again. So just like the Italian city-states way back during the revolution, what France was doing is it was ruling way too much of continental Europe, all right, um, and it caused a huge war. All right, so, um, so how does the uh, Congress of Vienna actually 
establish this balance of power. First off, it makes the Netherlands a lot stronger, all right? So before you had the Austrian Netherlands, right? And you had the, uh, the United Provinces of the Netherlands to the north because the Netherlands divided back in 1581, right? Now it's all gonna be one state and also Belgium is gonna be united with it. Okay, so Belgium plus the Netherlands are going to merge and become the kingdom of the United Netherlands. Okay, so a much stronger state to the north, which is going to make France think twice before they start to invade it. Okay, Prussia is going to get, again, like we were saying before, with, um, with compensation, Prus Prussia gets the Rhinelands. Okay, so this is another really significant strong state. We know how strong Prussia's military is. Okay, so that's also going to be on France's northern border. All right, Switzerland gets a guarantee of perpetual neutrality, which we know is important for World War I. All right. Now we're going to see um, the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire. We know it's already been kind of um, virtually non-existent for a while, but it officially is going to end at this point. And instead, we're going to see now that, um, that Germany is going to be organized into what's called the German Confederation. All right, so uh, basically um, it's going to be this organization of 39 different states out of that original 300. You might say, hey, this kind of sounds like what what uh, Napoleon was doing when he reorganized Germany. It's true. Actually, the German Confederation is is really kind of picking up on what Napoleon did, um, just reorganizing Germany, kind of no longer having it be those 300 uh, small kingdoms. All right. Um, this is going to make it obviously much easier to rule. Um, you're going to see that uh, part of the German Confederation is actually going to comprise Austria. All right. Um, so see how Austria, the whole empire is here, but then part of it, these this is the border of the German Confederation, so Austria is part of it, right? It may seem a little bit confusing, but... Um, so, actually, Austria is going to be the president of the Assembly of the Confederation, right? Um, and uh, we're going to see, basically, uh, it's this more of an organization of, of Germany, but they still, more or less, are a loose confederation. They're not, uh, they're all kind of independently sovereign, but um, it's... Uh, it's certainly, we're going to see Austria and Prussia emerge as some of the stronger states within that confederation. All right, um, what else? Here's a close-up of the German confederation. So again, see, um, see part of it, um, these strong states of Prussia here. Austria, they don't have actually circled in here, but Austria is part of this confederation as well. All right, so we see um, we see how Germany is going to actually maintain uh, Napoleon's reorganization. Um, we already talked. Oh, uh, I think I already talked previously about uh, about Poland, but again, there's um, a compromise on Poland reached. Um, Poland is uh, going to be ruled by Russia as the Congress Poland for 15 years with Alexander the First as king. All right, and uh, after this, we're going to see that really the only country that is a growing power um, at this point, all these other countries, they, um, you know, some of them may be established as a little bit stronger in reaction to France, but the only country that kind of uh, continues to increase in its power was the most major enemy of France, which was Great Britain. So we're going to see that their century of world leadership kind of starts here in 1814 and continues on to World War One.